Hi Stephanie uh, and everybody else. Welcome to the entomology collection of the Royal Ontario Museum. We have over a million specimens in the collection here, wow. um, ranging from pin specimens, such as you can see a bunch of beetles out here, uh, to stuff that's in ethyl alcohol. Uh, some stuff we were able to pin dry, and that's a great thing about it because they're easy to handle. You just pick them up by the pins. Um, and then the other stuff that's in alcohol, it's mostly uh, juvenile, immature forms of things like caddis flies and caterpillars because you can't pin those because they'll just shrivel up and dry. Uh, as I said, we have over a million specimens here. Uh, we, In terms of the size of specimens, the smallest thing that we have in the collection here is about two millimeters in length, so it's minute. That's a fairy wasp. It's considered the smallest specimen object in the entire museum. And then we have big uh, uh, scarab beetles that range about this big in size. Wow. If anybody ever tells you they see an insect bigger than that, don't <laughs> listen to them. It's not possible. Way back millions of years ago when there was more oxygen in the atmosphere, yeah, there were giant insects there. Um, so I have been here for closing in on 35 years. I started in 1985 on a five-year, gave myself a five-year plan. It's never really good with math, as you can tell. <laughs> um, and it's a great job. It's a, it's not just a job, it's a career. I love what I do. It's never the same day, two days in a row, unless I want it to be. Mm -hmm. um, my job ranges from uh, going out in the field and collecting insects as part of biodiversity studies. Um, because a lot, a lot of people don't think much about insects and arachnids, uh, which are spiders and things like that. Um, but they're basically at the, if you think about the food web, they're at the bottom because everything feeds on something that eventually it starts by feeding on insects. And if somebody wants to uh, determine whether a, an area, let's say a tropical forest, should be protected as a park, they need to know what is in there first. So we go, we travel around the world. We've been throughout North America, Central, South America, spent many years in Southeast Asia, tropical forest collecting there. So it's our curators who are responsible for identifying the species that we collect and describing new species. And in sheer numbers of different species of insects on this planet, there are about 1 million described or known to science right now. So that we have a scientific name assigned to them. So let's say the monarch butterfly, that's the common name, the scientific name is Danaeus plexippus. Um, so that's the scientific name, it's been described. There are, as I said, there are about a million already described known to science. There are upwards from of about another 30 million still waiting to be discovered and described. So do you want employment opportunities? <laughs> Guaranteed job security in the field of entomology. <laughs> um, compared to let's say, uh, Mammalogy. There might be 10,000 species of yeah. mammals on the planet, and virtually all of them are already known. So that's why when somebody describes a new species of mammal, it makes international headlines around the world. Somebody describes a new species of insect, they go, yeah, well, it's only 11 o'clock in the morning. Go describe a couple more this afternoon. Have you, like, let's keep up the pace. Have you discovered any? Uh, I haven't described any, but I have my last name assigned to... I think it is now six and a half species. Six and a half? Six and a half, yeah. Uh, when I was out in, uh, where was it, uh, Palau with our ichthyology curator, because I'm also a scuba diver. So okay. we, I got to do coral reef fish surveys. So we were uh, scuba diving there, and he discovered a new species of fish. So the genus name is Feta, the species name is Dabra. Da, the D-A starts, uh, is for David, his son's name, uh -huh. and the bra, the B-R-A, is represents my first name, Brad. So I get the butt end of the fish. <laughs> but I've had uh, some stoneflies and mayflies and some other things that are named, like wow. the genus name, and then Hubbleyi is the species name. So I'm pretty honored by that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as I said, it's never the same day twice in a row unless I want it to be. Uh, one uh, aside from field work. Uh, I do public programming, so going up to the gallery, giving show and tells there, um, going to schools, giving tours there, and uh, a lot of my job is sending out the specimens that we've collected over the years to specialists around the world, because no one entomologist can possibly know every species of insect on the planet. 
So in this case, you can see all these little tiny mm -hmm. beetles that I've got on the counter here. They belong to one family called darkling beetles. And so we loaned these out to a graduate student a few years ago, and he's now assigned a name to each of these. And so it's now my job to separate them into their individual species, database them, and then get them into the collection. Um, so that's the kind of thing that I'll do on a weekly basis. I'll, I'll search online for t other specialists around the world to say, hey, I've got these really cool flies. Uh, would you be interested in looking at them? And uh, we'll, if they say, yeah, then I'll package them all, send them out to them. And then a few years later, they've uh, done their research on them and they'll send them back and we now have scientific names associated with them. And one of the cool things that we're doing now is we have this um, super duper digital imaging system. It's called the Kiosk microscope camera. And it can image little tiny beetles of this size. Wow. Uh, and it'll take uh, multiple images at different depths of focus and stack them. And then you can blow it up. So something this small, uh, you can see, we can image it so it can increase the resolution, the size of it up to a thousand times. So it's a microscope and a camera. It's a microscope and a camera. So it's high-end macro photography. Wow. Uh, and we actually have some of the uh, images of these things on eMuseum now. If you do okay. look at the ROMS website and go to the uh, online collections and search for entomology, you'll see okay. these things. And you can zoom in and you get really up close and see all the facets on something like a fly's eye. That wow. People just see the fly, but they never realize just how intricate mm -hmm. these things are. Um, yeah, and so then this is other stuff that we had photographed as well. These, most people think all the really cool insects come from the tropics. These are silk moths that you can find here in Ontario. These are native species? These, the, these you will find here. Wow, they're uh, so big. Yeah, they're huge. So this is a really common one. This is the Cecropria moth. Um, that's the cocoon of it. This is one of my favorites, the Lona moth. Beautiful. Um, last time I found those, they were up on the Bruce Peninsula. But you can find the Cecropria moths here in the GTA. Yeah. And you typically find them in mid to late spring. And so we've had all of these photographed so that we can get those images online as well. We have this push to get uh, 100,000 objects and specimens photographed and made available to the public online. Uh, over a five-year period. Natural history has tended not to do that in the past because most of the things were small like this and to try to focus mm -hmm. on them was really difficult. But now that we have that new imaging system, we're able to do that. That's a very ambitious ambitious goal. Yeah, so I set myself up. So every morning at around 7.30, 8 o'clock, I'm in here and I get onto that uh, imaging system for a couple hours okay. and drink my tea okay. and just take one image after another. And so you're using the microscopic, the camera with the microscope yeah. for eMuseum as well? Yeah, as that, that's the primary purpose that it was purchased for, was okay. to do that. But we also have our curators who are using it to uh, image specimens as part of their scientific research mm -hmm. program as well. So instead of an illustrator having to draw something, like looking under a, a, mic a standard microscope and trying to illustrate it and mm -hmm. draw it and back and forth, now you can image something like this um, in probably like three or four minutes. Is the level of magnification enough that you see that it'll eventually replace a microscope? Well, it, uh, no, it, because it is a combination. It's a combination of microscope and camera right. and software. So what you do is you, you put the specimen and you focus, let's say, at the highest point mm -hmm. of the specimen, and then you say, okay, I want to focus at the lowest point, and you tell how far to scan it. You hit a button, and then the stage just moves around the camera goes up and down wow and then afterwards you just let the software do its trick and it stacks all those images together so you get one beautiful nice wow specimen that's totally completely in focus if you've done it right <laughs> and it, it took me quite a while to get to figure out all the ins and outs of it yeah. to finally get something that i uh, was happy to put online and i interacted with Brian Barr, a retired photographer, many times say, Brian, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? What do you think of this? Oh. And I kept getting feedback from him. I thought I was going to annoy him. And eventually he said, no, tweak this, try this, try this. He was great about that. Excellent. So there's collaboration then that goes beyond just entomologists. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, so I don't think anybody in the museum works in isolation. Yeah. They always work 
in, in tandem with someone else. Another example of that is uh, we have just completed a, a migration of all of, up until about a, two or three years ago, every database within every collection in the Art and Cultures Department and Natural History, they were all separate databases mm -hmm. and they never talked to each other. Um, I and Rob Mason and Art and Culture, we spearheaded, we were the coordinates for Natural History, coordinators, mm -hmm. Natural History and Art and Culture, to get all those disparate databases into mm -hmm. one system called the museum system. So now we have one mega database that has I mean, four million records in it. Um, so if somebody wanted to say, show me everything that the museum has from Vietnam. <laughs> Three years ago, they'd have to go and search through 20 different databases. Now they go into one database, type in the country of Vietnam, and boom, pull up all the records. Everything. Wonderful. And a great thing is we can attach images, video, documents to the system. That's great. another ambitious project that yeah, the museum we, has undertaken. We just completed the third major phase of it, and the last phase is getting the library and archives records okay. in there. So it's going to make it a lot nicer to do our job here. Excellent. If you can't tell by now that I'm enthusiastic about what I do and what I love, then you haven't been paying attention to anything I've said. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Brad.